Welcome to The Art of Discernment, a podcast where professors from across the Master's University discuss current events and higher education from a biblical worldview. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Art of Discernment. I'm Dr. Bob Dixon, and joining me today is esteemed professor of biblical studies and Greek at the Master's University, Dr. Will Varner. Dr. Varner, so nice to have you. It is really good to be here, and I've been looking forward to this. So have I. Before we even get started, i got to get your credentials out because they're so impressive. You've got a bachelor's degree from Bob Jones University. Not one, not two, but three master's degrees, one from Dropsy College and two from Biblical Theological Seminary and a doctorate from Temple University. So, you, you know, Bob, <laughs> I, you know, I had three master's degrees. You know, nobody should have to have three master's degrees. You know, when I was going through that, I said, can I trade two of these for a doctorate? And they said, <laughs> no, that's not the way it works. So I had to go on for a doctorate after the three. Well, as I said, highly esteemed. You have been a professor here. Dr. Varner, how long? Well, I just finished my 25th year, and this is the beginning of number 26. Well, we, we have been blessed by your presence, and today will be no different, I'm sure. As you mentioned, it's a very exciting topic. I also have been looking forward to it. And a little bit more about your bio before we get into this topic that I'm so excited to talk to you about. Dr. Varner is the author of, among other books, Passionate About the Passion Week and Anticipating the Advent. And those are the first two books of a trilogy he recently completed. And the release of book number three is... I believe, due out in October. Yes. And that book is will be titled Messiah's Ministry, Crisis of the Christ. And when it does come out, you can find it on Amazon. And that will be the topic of our conversation today. Specifically, though, a very interesting chapter of all interesting chapters, but this one really piqued my interest. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about Melchizedek, a very intriguing figure in the Old Testament, also mentioned in New Testament. So, Dr. Varner, before we even get out of the gate, who was Melchizedek and why does he matter? So, that's a huge question, but we'll start there. Well, I mentioned uh, Melchizedek in the chapter as a mystery man, you know, and Whenever I talk about Melchizedek, I mention that he sort of comes on the scene uh, there in Genesis and says his few words to Abraham, and then he's gone. And I oftentimes think of a fun parallel with uh, Alfred Hitchcock, who oftentimes <laughs> wrote himself into his movies as a walk-on, as a cameo. Uh, I remember one time the elevator opens and out walks this short, bald-headed guy, and he walks away, and that's Alfred Hitchcock. And you say, well, who was that guy? Is he ever going to appear again in the film? No. <laughs> he, he's on and he's gone. It's a cameo. And Melchizedek is sort of like that. He's an actor that walks under the stage, says one or two short lines, walks off the stage, and he never appears in the drama again. Uh, and that's in Genesis. But what he says is tremendously important. Uh, later, uh, he's only mentioned one other time in the Old Testament. Uh, the psalmist mentions him, mm. you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But then the writer of Hebrews gives him a whole chapter of uh, drama uh, because he compares Jesus' priesthood to the priesthood of Melchizedek. Okay, so I don't, I don't know how you pulled that off. I thought I could ask someone else that question and get... 30 minute answer and not have the clarity that you just provided. So that's that's fantastic. So well, let's drill down on this a bit. What information does the scripture provide us about Melchizedek? You mentioned, you know, he's brief mentions in the Old Testament and then Hebrews. Kind of dig into that a bit. You know, how are we to to look at this actor that shows up in, in scripture? Yeah. Moses says he's a priest and he's a king. That's what he is. And even that in itself is strange because Israelites didn't have priest kings. There were priests from the tribe of Levi. There were kings from the tribe of Judah. You didn't have a priest king. So uh, he's unique, but he was not of the family of Abraham. It says he was a king of Salem, which is probably Jerusalem, and he was priest of the Most High God. But again, you know, there's no post history about him, there's no prehistory. He's just there and he's gone. But evidently, he's known well enough for Abraham to recognize him hmm. and to honor him and to receive a blessing from him. And as the writer of Hebrews says, the lesser one is blessed from the greater. So we do know that as great as Abraham was, Melchizedek must have been greater because he blessed 
Abram, as he's called then. Mm -hmm. He's later named uh, Abraham. So he receives this blessing. Salem is probably Jerusalem. It's a shortened form of Jerusalem. So he looks like some guy um, who was a descendant of Noah, obviously, but who still knew the one true God. He was even priest of the one true God, which tells us that maybe the knowledge of God didn't completely die off after uh, Noah and his sons, but there were some who maintained that knowledge of the one true God. Jethro is another one mm. that appears later. Very few of them, but evidently he preserved the knowledge of the one true God, and Abraham knew about him, and Abraham gave him gifts and received a blessing from him. And the New Testament writer of the Hebrews really makes a big deal about that in relation to Jesus Christ. So kind of dovetailing off of that, what does the writer of Hebrews say to us and what does that reveal to us about how we should think about Melchizedek? He picks up on the idea that Melchizedek was a priest king. Many Bible readers, even Christian Bible readers, are oftentimes surprised when they find out that this teaching about the priesthood of Jesus Christ is actually introduced and confined to one New Testament book. That's the book of Hebrews. We oftentimes talk about, and rightly so, Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. But this idea of him being priest, we look back to the book of Hebrews, where it is a major subject. And uh, the Old Testament roots of that, the writer of Hebrews says, is in Genesis 14, where Jesus is a type of priest like Melchizedek. He's a type of priest king like Melchizedek. Of course, the book of Hebrews goes back to Genesis 14, but by way of uh, Psalm 110. Okay. Abner Chow and I like to talk about the intertextuality mm -hmm. of scriptures, how scriptures are connected. And sometimes scriptures, New Testament scriptures, are not only connected to one Old Testament verse, but they go back through two of them. And so here, the writer of Hebrews is connecting Hebrews 7 back to Psalm 110, you are a priest forever after all the Melchizedek, and then going all the way back to Genesis uh, 14. And so the writer of Hebrews says, notice how great this man was to whom Abraham paid tithes. That's the order. That's the type of priesthood that Jesus is because he's not a Levitical priest. Uh, they came later from the tribe of Levi, but Jesus' priesthood goes back not to the tribe of Levi and Aaron, the high priest of Israel, but goes all the way back to a pre-Israelite uh, priesthood who was not only a priest but a king. And as I said before, priests and kings didn't exist in Israel. Okay. So uh, the type, the model of Jesus as our priest king goes back uh, to Melchizedek, not just to the Israelite priest or Israelite king. Okay, that's really helpful. So if I'm understanding this correctly, what the author of Hebrews is doing is, is using what we know of Melchizedek, what little the Old Testament re reveals about Melchizedek to help us illustrate a, a way to look at Christ. Now, Scripture being what it is, and as you said, Melchizedek is a mystery man to a degree, surely, and is the focus of speculation, I know. Uh, I'm sure a lot of interesting views have uh, cropped up regarding Melchizedek. What are some of those? Yeah. As a matter of fact, it's big, big discussion. Who was Melchizedek? The traditional Jewish view, which I don't think has much basis as all, at all, was that he was Shem, one of the sons of Noah. But uh, while it could possibly be shown that Shem was still alive during the days of Melchizedek, he wasn't Shem. And the biggest argument against that is, if he was Shem, why wasn't he called Shem? Right. <laughs> In Genesis 4, I mean, Shem's a, you know, big guy, a big name. Why hide his name? But the Christian views are that it was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, that here is Jesus, the priest king, meeting Abraham in a pre-incarnate way. While there are good and godly 
teachers who teach that. I, I don't think that's the best approach to it. I think the best uh, approach is not that it's a pre-incarnate appearance of, of Jesus, but that this was an actual priest king who is a type of Jesus. He is an example. He's a pre-incarnate type of Jesus that foreshadows the type of priesthood uh, that Jesus would have. And I think the, the answer to that is Jesus is spoken of as being in the order of Melchizedek. It doesn't say he was Melchizedek. <laughs> right. He was in the order of Melchizedek. Now, what's the order? Well, the order of Melchizedek was a special order of priests, pre-Israelite, that were priest kings. And so Jesus is uh, the priest king. So, so uh, And also, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, Melchizedek was made like the Son of God. Didn't say he was the Son of God. So that made like is this interesting mm -hmm. uh, topic of typology. Uh, he is a type of the priesthood that Jesus would have. You know, um, Bob, uh, interesting things about Melchizedek are not only what is said about him, but what is not said about mm, him. Yes. Uh, his parents are not mentioned. His kids are not mentioned. It's like he's without a genealogy. And so the writer of uh, Hebrews mentions that, without mother, without father, in a book where your genealogy is always mentioned, mm -hmm. Genesis 5, Genesis 11, all these genealogies in, in Genesis, in a book where there are genealogies, there's no genealogy for this guy. Not because he didn't have a mother or father, but because his mother or father were not recorded. Not because he didn't have children, but because his children are not recorded. So he, he appears like an eternal person. So like that, he is made like the Son of God. Now, uh, Jesus had a mother, but not father. So it, it's not so much that Jesus is without mother or father. Right. It's Jesus' genealogy goes back through his mother, but he's an eternal person who existed before he was born to Mary. So in those ways, Melchizedek was a type of the priesthood of Jesus. That's fascinating. I can see where people go astray on this because while, like we said, Melchizedek is illustrative of Jesus, Jesus is not illustrative of, of Melchizedek. That's it right. doesn't go the other way. But people will find those between the lines host of false religions have existed between the lines of Scripture, between the words of Scripture even. So I can see the problems that would arise from this. But uh, Bob, uh, I saw one time, I, I don't know exactly where they are, that there's some sort of cult of Melchizedekans somewhere. <laughs> I, I don't, don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know exactly what they believe apart from worshiping Melchizedek, the Melchizedekians. So yeah, um, Literal interpretation means let's ex it let's believe it, uh, interpret it the way it's written. But if it's written in a way that says he's made like the Son of God, that raises the issue of typology. And I think that's the best approach, that Melchizedek was a real human being, real priest, real king, but he was a symbol and type of what Jesus would be. So how do you make the distinction when looking at something like this in Scripture between what's literally there and then and, and when you say like a type of, a type mm -hmm. of, how do you work that out? One of the best and safe ways, Bob, is because you can go crazy on typology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, you really can. You can see everything in the Old Testament is a type. When the New Testament says it's a type, when the New Testament says it's an example, when the New Testament says Melchizedek was made like the Son of God. There's an indication that it's a type. That's the safest way. And uh, I think that's, you know, a good hermeneutical principle. When the New Testament either calls it a type or gives us an indication that this person was not only real, but he was also symbolic, then we're on safe grounds for exploring how is that a type. For example, the wood of the tabernacle sometimes is supposed to be a type of the humanity of Christ. What? It is? <laughs> okay. Now, at the same time, the sacrifices and the high priest of the tabernacle are types 
of Jesus because the New Testament says that very clearly. But the New Testament nowhere says that the wood in the tabernacle is a type of the humanity of Christ. That's going beyond Scripture. So even sticking with Scripture to call it a type is the safe grounds on which we can call it a type. Dr. Varner, thank you so much for joining me. This has been, as expected, very fascinating, very intriguing, and extremely eye-opening. I appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thank you for listening to The Art of Discernment. For more information on the Masters University, visit masters.edu. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We'll see you next time.